Let's pray together. God, we are so grateful for the opportunity to gather today. Whether we're gathered online in Jasper and Canton, God, the church is not somewhere we go. It is who we are. We don't go to church, we gather as the church. So every week, God, we get to have another family reunion where we hang out together, see each other. But we also, God, gather for the purpose of glorifying you and hearing from you, worshiping you. So God, thank you for the songs we've already sang, for the people we've already seen. Now, God, as we get to the portion of our gathering where we are expressly sitting down to hear from you. We ask you, God, to speak to us. We love your word. We are so grateful and thankful for it because in it, we have your self-revelation and we want to receive everything that you have for us like we talked about several weeks ago. So God, I pray that you would enable us to do that by your spirit. Help me to communicate it in a way that honors you. And God, I pray that it would be helpful to us because this word today, God, is so necessary for this cultural moment. God, we thank you for it. We ask you to apply it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got a Bible, we're in John chapter 17. We've been there for the last several weeks. We're actually going to wrap up chapter 17 this week, looking at the last part of Jesus' high priestly prayer. And I've told you, if you've been here, if you haven't, I'll kind of recap quickly for you. And let's be honest, those of you that have been need to hear this too, because we forget, right? It's very encouraging to a pastor and communicator to hear that people forget like 97% of the things that you say to them. It really makes my Mondays really awesome. Um, So I want to remind you that Jesus categorically prayed for three different things. He prayed for himself, He prayed for his current disciples at that time, which now would apply to us. And then he prayed for future disciples. And so the section that we're going to see today is him praying for those future disciples. John chapter 17, verse 20 through 26. And what I love about this is even back then, Jesus had this on his mind. Even back then, Jesus had this subject matter uh, as a matter of his prayers. And and the reason why I love that is because it's so easy for churches, for Christians, for pastors to get so present focused that they lose this kind of future focus of looking forward to what God is going to do. And that's something that I always try to make sure that we do as a church are looking forward and saying, God, we're so grateful for what you've done. You know, it's important to look, look back, but we want to look forward to what you're going to do. But Jesus doesn't just look forward to what God is going to do. He also looks forward to the people that God is going to bring in, the people that God's going to bring into this new family called the church. So let's go John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21, and I'll kind of set up our whole Time together. Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me. Again, that's future oriented through their word, that they may all be one, this future group. Just as you, Father, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. A lot of in language there, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So the context, again, of this, you see in the very first sentence there, Jesus says, I do not ask for these only. If you were here last week, again, I talked about how Jesus mentioned what he wasn't praying for. And we asked the question, okay, Jesus, why did you tell us what you weren't praying for? Why didn't you just not pray for it? And we said the reason why, at least I thought the reason why, was Jesus knew that we were going to ask that in the future. And what we would ask is, hey, God, why don't you take us out of here? This world done lost its mind. Come on back. And Jesus says, don't ask for that. The point is not to get you out. The point is to empower you to get you through because you have a mission to accomplish. And that 
statement of not asking is connected to this statement of what he says, I'm also not asking for these only. So again, you have to ask the question of, okay, Jesus, why are you telling us that you're not only asking for these, but you're asking for those? Because not only do we have a propensity to ask for the wrong things, we have a propensity to just focus on the wrong people. And what I mean by that is, it is human nature to turn inward. It is human nature. Martin Luther said human beings are curved in on themselves. The best way I can think about it is like your fingernails or your toenails. My mom used to hate my toenails. That's a weird sermon point to make. <clears throat> I don't know if I've ever said that before. But she used to hate cutting my toenails and I used to hate her cutting my toenails because it was like, and this is why Lizzie's like, you want a pedicure? No, number one, I'm a dude. Number two, it's scary. Because when they start getting working on, I'm like, oh, I mean, just you know, it gives me the heebie-jeebies, right? I would rather you take a chainsaw to them to have somebody else. I would rather do that myself. But my toenails curve. And when they curve, it like almost like goes into my skin. Yes, we're having a conversation about my toes. I'm sorry. Here. But it's an illustration. It just came to my mind, all right? It just came to my mind. I'm just as surprised as you are about this, all right? <laughs> but they're curved in on themselves, that's the illustration of what I'm trying to say. Human beings are naturally curved in on themselves. Let me say it to you like this. No one has to teach you how to center yourself. No one has to teach you to say mine, right? Those of you that have children, you understand this. You try your hardest to try to get them to say mama, dada, but you don't ever have to teach them to say mine. It comes natural. And so I love that Jesus is saying, hey, God, I'm not just praying for these only. So that those that were in earshot of what Jesus would say would hear him say, I love you, but I also love them. Why? Because if human beings have a tendency to turn in on themselves and human beings are the leaders in churches, guess what happens in churches? They have a tendency to turn in on themselves. They have a tendency just to navel gaze, right? And sit around fires and sing kumbaya and us four and no more, Lord. This is why, sadly, over 80% of the churches in America are dead or dying. And the definition of that is they have not baptized any new believers in years. Why? I don't think it's because they have as their mission statement to be unfaithful to God. We exist to do the opposite of what God says. No. Because it's just natural human tendency to turn inward. But I love that Jesus says, I'm not just asking for these only. Why? Because he knew that every church would be so tempted to ask for these only to ask for my family only, to ask for me only, right? So the title of today's message is Not For These Only. It's interesting to me and amazing to me that Jesus prayed for the future believers. The reason why that's amazing to me is because that includes all of us. Aren't you glad that back then he was praying for you? that he was praying for you to come in and, and that you would believe that I would believe through their word? But let's take this a step further. Aren't you so grateful that the early church actually spoke the words of Jesus? Because if they had not spoke it, then there would be no us. If they had not listened to Jesus, not only pray about it, but empower them through the person of the Holy Spirit, and then they turned outward, then we wouldn't be here. This is what makes it so devastating when churches become inward because what you unintentionally say is now that I'm in, we're good. Grace came to me, but it can stop with me. It doesn't have to go through me. It's 
to those. And that is so antithetical to who Jesus is and how Jesus prayed. It's also interesting what he prays for here. He says that they may be one. Now, Pastor David talked about this a few weeks ago when Jesus prayed for his disciples to be one. But again, it's quite intriguing to me that Jesus not only prayed for his current disciples to be one, but his future disciples to be, born, to be one. Maybe it's because Jesus knew the tendency is to act like two instead of just one. The tendency is to focus on division and divisiveness than oneness. How many of you know there's profit in division? There's profit. My, my dad told me this uh, when I was hunting with him over Thanksgiving, and he heard it from uh, a guy that he bought a business from you know, decades ago. He said, Jason, never forget, there's profit in chaos. Why is our world so chaotic? Why is our world so divided? Because people profit from that. People profit from firing you up and dividing you. But Jesus prayed, you'd be one. You'd be one. Now what's interesting, that's singular, but plural at the same time. It's like the word you. Well, I need to know what context is. If it's you, am I talking to you singular or am I talking to you as a group? Because you could be a singular group, but a bunch of people in the group. What's interesting is almost the entire New Testament is written in second person plural. What that means is almost every time you see the word you, it ain't just referring to you. Let me say it redneck. It's referring to y'all. Right? We have a lot of transplants, right? Maybe it's you I don't know how you say it. You guys. You guys. <laughs> right? Notice this oneness isn't singular in yourself. It's singular with you and all who believe. The best example of this is marriage, which is why the Bible uses marriage as one of its primary metaphors. The scriptures open with the marriage and they end with a marriage. They open with a marriage between Adam and Eve. They end with the marriage between Jesus and his bride. I'm looking forward to that heavenly wedding cake, y'all. I ain't gonna lie. But in marriage, the Bible says, the two become what? One. One flesh. Now, here's what's amazing about this. The two don't like magically meld into one person literally. Like there was a man, there was a woman, and now there's this new thing, right? There's this new creature that's not a man or a woman. No, it, a man and woman come together, and it's amazing because they fit together, even anatomically speaking, and so they, they come together as one, but they still remain male and female, but their oneness now is in their new relationship status, right? Let's change on Facebook. Do we still do that? I never did it. I don't know. And here's what's amazing. Jesus also gives the example of the Trinity. There is one God that exists in three persons. The Father is not the Son or the Spirit. The Son is not the Father or the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father or the Son. But they are one. You're like, how does that happen? Well, number one, you're describing God, so you can't fully understand it. 
Because if you could, you'd be God. You think God is limited to this eight pound thing that Jerry Maguire's stepson told us about? You don't remember that movie? Okay. He's way beyond your capacity to understand him. But here's what you can understand. Three persons, one God. In the same way that marriage is two persons, one flesh. You say, okay, well, how does that live out? Here's how it lives out. Each person no longer exists for the benefit of themselves, but they exist for the benefit of the other. The man says, I exist for your benefit and your flourishing. The woman says, I exist for your benefit and your flourishing. So their oneness is in their commitment to take up their cross, deny themselves, right? And serve the other. Well, let's take that same mentality and say, Jesus wants that to be the defining characteristic of his believers, those who follow him. They don't exist for the benefit of themselves. They exist, watch us, for the benefit of the family. They exist for the benefit of the other. Now let's talk a little bit more about this whole idea of oneness. You don't have to turn there, but I'll give you a reference verse. Ephesians chapter two, verses 13 through 16, because what you see in the rest of the New Testament is the theological outworking of what Jesus did in the gospels. So Paul comes along and he explains this. In Ephesians chapter two, he explains it like this. Now, if you've been around here, you know some of my favorite verses are in Ephesians two before verse 13, where it says we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God, best two words in the Bible, made us, plural, alive, together with Christ, seated us with him. Well, out of that, out of that saving, then what happens? Look at what Paul says, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you, that's plural, by the way, who were once, notice that, take the C out, what word do you get? One, that was good, that was an easy one who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both, what? One, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Verse 15, by abolishing the law and commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, how many? One new man, you could translate that humanity, one hu new humanity in the place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Here's what Paul's talking about. Before Christ, there used to be hostility between each one of us and God. There was something that separated us between God or from God. What's interesting, he talks about the dividing wall of hostility. That's two words. It's a wall that divides or separates. And in Christ, that wall comes down. And that wall that separated us between God and humanity was sin. That's why God had to punish sin in Christ. It had to be paid for because God is a God of justice. He's a just God. So that wall has come down. But here's what's interesting. Paul says, not only has that wall come down between us and God, but the walls between us and others have also come down. That's the argument he's making here. One new humanity. A new way of seeing yourself as human. Here's what's amazing. You know, there's been a lot of conversations over the last several years about race relations, about, you know, justice, and those are good conversations. 
The sad thing, though, is that a lot of the civil rights conversation has moved outside of its grounding in the scriptures because the argument is found right here in the scriptures. It's what Martin Luther King himself was so great at doing. He grounded the truth that we're all created equal by our creator. What's amazing is even our constitution acknowledges this fact. So the problem of America was we were not living up to who we now were in Christ. And thank God for the strides we've made along the way in that. But here's what's unfortunate. What's unfortunate in a lot of churches, future believers, there still exist unnecessary dividing walls. Now listen to me. Not every boundary is unbiblical. Let me say that again. Not every boundary is unbiblical. There are biblical boundaries. Let's just talk about beliefs, right? I've said this before. There are orthodox beliefs. The word orthodox, ortho means straight, dox, doxology, belief system, straight beliefs, right beliefs, correct beliefs. This is why we have orthodontist, which means straight teeth, right? Well, no one wants to go to an orthodontist and come out crooked. You're like, well, what is crooked? This is straight, this is crooked, right? Do you want to go to an orthodontist? It's like, well, that doesn't look crooked to me. Well, bro, your eyesight's off. Because I don't know if you can park between two straight lines, but that line ain't straight. So it's good to have boundaries. You see what I'm saying? And when it comes to beliefs, it's good to have boundaries. And so there are unorthodox beliefs like Jesus is not the only way to God. That's unorthodox. That's a boundary too far. Like the Bible is not infallible or inerrant. You know, there's some mistakes in it. Like there's other scriptures beyond this one. That God is not Trinity. You see what I'm saying? All of those are out of bounds. It's like saying in football, we're going to play football now with no boundaries. Like, are you referring to soccer or football? Yes, I am. Right? You got to have boundaries within the game. But listen to me. But there are some boundaries that are unbiblical. Boundaries like one group is better than the other. Or one group must become like the other group in order to be in the group. You realize that was the argument in Acts chapter 15? Because the early church was primarily Jewish and Jewish people followed, obviously, the Old Testament law. And in the Old Testament law, there were things that talked about how you could cut your hair, things that talked about what food you could eat, and so when new believers were coming into the early church in Jerusalem, the church's biggest struggle, go read this in Acts 15, was, well, do the Gentiles need to become Jewish in order to become Christian? Which ultimately meant you must become circumcised. I've joked about this, but I, I mean it seriously. Thank God that is no longer a requirement for church membership. That would have made welcome trek Real weird. <laughs> right? That dividing wall is down now in Christ. But here's what happens a lot of times in churches, particularly over ethnic cultural things. The concept is, well, if you're black, then you must become more white in order to come to church. 
or you're of this race, you must become like this race in order to be a part of this group. That dividing wall is unbiblical because there is now in Christ not a majority race. In fact, let me give you this point. Grace creates a new race. Grace creates a new race. I heard that this week from a pastor and I thought it was so good. Grace creates a new race. And in this new race, check this, everybody has the same story. Everybody. And here it is. I once was lost, but now I'm found. That's your story. Now you have more details than that on how lost you were or what your family group was or what your ethnicity is. And no one is saying that any of that should not be shared or celebrated. But what I am saying is none of that should be elevated against someone else's story. Because there is no privileged race. We're all the same in Christ. You're a sinner. You needed a savior. That's the story. But the problem in churches is we put up unnecessary dividing walls. Here's what's interesting. This word dividing wall, I told you it's two words. Dividing wall is a separate Greek word or dividing. And then wall comes from our, uh, or it's a Greek word where we get our English word pragmatic. And here's what I found so fascinating. You go look up the word pragmatic and about, I think it's number five on the de dictionary.com definition. It says referring to the affairs of state or community. And what's interesting, it just means boundary, right? Well, you understand that in a state, well, let's, let's go wider. In a country, our country has boundaries. Our country has borders. Why? Because that's very pragmatic to have borders. And it is not wrong or bad to have borders and enforce borders. And then within that country, we have states, and states have borders. A lot of them follow rivers, which make them a lot less straight, especially when you get out west, where God ran out of things to create. We have real straight lines. It's okay to have those. It's very pragmatic. Then within the state, we have counties. You want to know one of the primary reasons we have counties? It's because back in the 17th and 18th century, we didn't have cars. And so someone living up in North Georgia to drive to Atlanta was tough. Someone living in South Georgia, to, I mean, they weren't driving, right? They were riding a mule. And so it was very pragmatic to create counties and put the locus of control so that you could get state services within each county. And then with each county, you have cities. You see what I'm saying? It's very pragmatic to have boundaries. Here's the problem. It's also very pragmatic in churches sometimes to have boundaries. Let me say it to you like this. It's easier to have a church made up of all one race. It's very pragmatic to have, it's not just race, to have a church made up of one generation. I don't know if you were alive or in church about 20, 30 years ago, but in church we had these things called worship wars, which is just crazy to me. We're warring over worship instead of using worship as our weapon. Interesting. But it was generational fights. And every generation curves in on itself and unintentionally can have an attitude of no, it's for these only. Instead of how Jesus prayed, not for these only. So it's very pragmatic to have boundaries. What I'm saying is, let's not have any more that are not biblical. It's okay to have biblical boundaries, like what you must believe, what the behavior looks like, but it is sinful to have any more boundaries than that. 
See, that's what Paul says. Grace took those walls down. It's a new race of people. I did a message series back in 2015 on the Ten Commandments, and interestingly enough, I mean, I've been talking about this for a long time. On the week of do not murder, I came up with a new word that I thought was so awesome, and then I found out later it wasn't new. Someone else came up with it. It deflated me a little. That's all right. I'm trying to be not for these only. And the word was gracism. It's interesting. You look at the word grace, take the G off, what do you have? Race. If you look at the word gracism, you take the G off, you have racism. See, here's what's crazy. The world wants a world with no racism, but doesn't have the power to get it because they don't have grace. But the church should also want a world with no racism and also has the power to actually get it because of grace. So grace creates a new race. Here's what's amazing about what Jesus did. Let me just give you a very short history lesson. If you go look at the first 11 chapters of your Bible, Genesis 1 through 11, it ends in chapter 11. It was a pivotal point at the Tower of Babel or Babel. And what happened at that point is the world had come together as one, but they unified over the opposite of what God told them to do. God said, spread out. And they were like, no, we're going to stay here and build a tower. So God says he divided the languages and made people groups. But then in Genesis chapter 12, you get the story of Abraham. And what happens in the story of Abraham? God chooses one man from one nation and says to him, through you, I'm gonna bless all nations. So he divided. Next chapter, you get the solution. What was Acts 2 about? Acts 2 was about God reversing Genesis 11. Because in Acts 2, Peter stands up and speaks, and then all these people from other nations who just happened to be in Jerusalem at the time heard the gospel in their language. And so it wasn't so much that Peter was speaking unintelligible words. He was speaking, but the Spirit was translating it. There was tongues of fire that came over their heads, and they're like, hold up. He is speaking not our language, but I hear it in Spanish. Why? Why? Because of grace. See, grace is the translation that we need between the races. Because here's the story. God didn't just love the Jewish people. He loves all people. And the salvation of all people was going to come from one people. Better yet, one person. You see why Jesus would pray this way? Let's, let's keep going. John chapter 17, verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, that they may be, what? One. Jesus won't come off with this, y'all. That they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. Here's what's crazy. Our best testimony to the world is to show that all people can worship together. One God. That's our best testimony to the world. That this grace, this gospel, this good news is for all people. That this grace can break down the dividing walls that exist between me and my fellow neighbor. Why do you think we talk with family language in church? Brother, sister. You know, my title is Pastor Jason, but I can always tell somebody who's been in church, particularly probably a Baptist church, because they'll call me Brother Jason, which is not a bad title. The only problem is, I'm not the only brother. See, brother is not my title in Christ. 
In, in the sense of like my giftedness, it is my title in Christ in reference to my sonship. See, Jesus is my brother. But check this. If Jesus is your brother, guess, that what, guess what that makes you and me? Brothers. Like, if Jesus is my brother, Jesus is your brother, we both got the same brother, we brothers. See what I'm saying? So when that dividing wall between me and God came down in Christ, it should have came down between you and me too. That's what he's saying. Let's go verse 24. Look at this. I love this. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you have loved me before the foundation of the world. It's interesting, that word desire. It means to wish or to want. We might even say today, these are my dreams. Now, I already referenced them earlier, but one of the famous speeches in human history was Martin Luther King at the steps of the Washington Mon Monument in D.C. when he said, I have a what? Anybody know? Where do you think he got that dream? Right there. This wish. This desire. It's Jesus' desire. It's Jesus' desire for everyone he died for to be with him. I don't know if you've done this, but you can go read the book of Revelation. And again, we'll, we'll read it at one point and we'll teach through it because it's fascinating. But John has a vision. Same guy who wrote this book. Dare I say he had a dream. And he looks into heaven. And it, he sees this great multitude which no one can number. And then he says this. All worshiping the lamb from every tribe, tongue, and nation. The picture of Revelation is the image of what Jesus desires right there. And I want you to know something. Jesus is gonna get what he desires. The question is, is he gonna get it through us? Let me go further. He says, oh, righteous father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. These the title of the message is not for these only, but these know. They know what? They know my desire. They know my dream. They know my wish. They know why you sent me. And then he says this. How do they know? I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Church, I have to ask the question. If the desires of Jesus aren't in us, then is the love of Jesus in us? Because if the love of Jesus is in us, the desires of Jesus will be in us. This is why John says in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, anyone who claims to love God but hates his brother, the love of God ain't in him. See, I only love that brother to the degree I love this brother. And this brother, by default, is my brother from another mother. Let me give you some qualifiers. This brother might not be the same race as me. This brother may not be the same political party as me. Ooh, I'm stepping on toes now, y'all. <laughs> it's interesting. Whenever we have a political party voting, what do we call it? 
We call it a race. See, racist isn't just skin color related. My brother may not look like me, may not vote like me, may not be the same generation as me, may not be the same gender as me, and none of those can be a dividing wall that stops my love for them because that came down in Christ. Let me leave you with this. Last point. Jesus desires they also be with him. Do we? Jesus desires that. Do we? Now, one of the things I love about our church is we do everything that we can to live this out. To be a church that doesn't exist for these only. We just did Hope for Christmas. Over 1,300 kids came into our doors and we gave them gifts. Why? So we could earn the right to give them the ultimate gift, which is Christ. And to let them know, we see you. We're here for you. We exist for your benefit. Jesus wants you in this family. We want you in this family. That's why we started Jasper. Because we love the people of Pickens County. And it became, um, is it unpractical or impractical? Impractical. Yeah, I've heard it both the ways. Uh, it became impractical for people in Pickens County to drive so far to Cherokee County. That's why they made it a separate county. So guess what? We were like, hey, yo, check this. We need a church up in that county. <laughs> That's our whole mission right here. <laughs> we need a church up in that county. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> we need a church up in that group. And we'll go further into other counties, into other countries. Why? Because Jesus desires that we do. Because Revolution Church doesn't exist for Revolution Church only. It exists for these only that Jesus has saved. And these only ain't all here yet. Not till they become us is the mission accomplished. See, it amazes me. Remember I told you, Jesus said, don't ask for God to take you out. It amazes me how people will pray so much for God to take them out and they won't do the one thing that would actually usher it in, which is share Christ. Listen, you can buy land and dig a hole and put a bus in the ground and get all the MREs you want. You can grow vegetables, get goats, have generators and water. I'm cool with it all. But you're only delaying if you don't take Christ to the nations. It's amazing to me how the church gets caught up in that mess that keeps asking for God to take them out instead of empower them and send me back in, coach. Because I ain't done. No man left behind until they know that you love them. Church, that's our mission. That's what Jesus desires, do we? Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us, that you moved into the neighborhood, 
that you became like us. Hebrews says, your brothers and sisters had flesh, so you had to put on flesh. Because God can't die, but humans can die. So you had to be made like us in every way, tempted like us in every way. So that you could get us back to your Father. And God, forgive us for the times where we have put unnecessary dividing walls up for pragmatism's sake. God, it's not wrong to have biblical boundaries. It's just wrong to have unbiblical ones. So God, help us as a church to continue to take this message through this mission of making disciples in all nations until every eye has seen and every ear has heard about Christ. If we're not dead, we're not done. We don't want to be a dead church because then we're done. But God, we know today there are some dead people that maybe they've never heard the message that God loved them so much that he sent Christ to bring them home for them to be saved. And so God, I pray right now you would open their eyes to see the truth of who Jesus is and you would save them. No one looking around or talking if you feel like God is speaking to you and helping you understand that there's never come a point in time where Jesus became your brother because you haven't trusted him. And maybe the reason why you have so much hate in your heart is because you don't know love. God is love. So to know love, you have to know God. So if you want to trust Christ today and be saved, you can pray with me. You don't have to do it out loud. This is simply a confession to our Father. And it goes like this. Say, Father, thank you for loving me that you sent Jesus to become like me, but to do what I couldn't do by living a sinless life. but also to take on what I deserve, which was death. But he beat it. He came back to life again. I believe in Jesus. So would you make me alive in him? Forgive me of my sins. I'm trusting in Jesus. If you're here in one of our physical locations and you just prayed that with me, would you just simply lift up your hand so we could see that? We got men and women gonna walk around, put a gift in your hand, and when they do, you can put that down. Thank you. But then those of us who've trusted Christ, we can never forget that we as the people of God, the church, are the outpost of the kingdom of God that is sent to take the message to those that don't know. So maybe God is revealing some dividing walls in your heart that you've put up. You know, we just came through a really nasty political season. And maybe you have some hatred about people that don't vote like you, but if they're in Christ, that hatred is sinful. That is an unbiblical boundary that you've erected. Maybe they don't look like you. Maybe they're not in your generation. And you need to confess and repent. There's grace. But in God's family, there is no privileged people. We all have the same story. But the good news is we have the most powerful story and what the world so desperately wants, we have. So let's show it to them. Let's live it out as the new family of Jesus where grace grace created this new humanity where we're defined by who Jesus is. Father, would you create that? God, I love our church for this reason. 
I'm not preaching this because I think we lack this as a church. I'm preaching this just to remind us that this is your wish. God, I love this church and I love that we love people well. But God, help us to continue to keep that as our mission, that we would pray like you pray, not for these only, but we would always be outward focused by living life on mission, starting new groups, starting new teams, starting new campuses, starting new churches, God, because more and more people need to know Jesus. Help us to stay on mission. In Jesus' name, amen.